everybody today for the latest in our Hydroterra webinar series. It's great to have so many attendees. It's fantastic, in fact. Uh, today, the topic we're looking at is rehydrating Australia's landscape, the productivity and environmental benefits. Uh, next slide, thanks, Michelle. Uh, so our presenter today is Luke Peel from the Maloon Institute. Maloon Institute uh, has a research farm or a, a few farms actually uh, up out of Canberra. Uh, Luke will talk more to that. Uh, we've, Hydroterra has been heavily involved with the Maloon Institute over the last three years, designing their monitoring system and working with them about uh, looking at indicators of catchment health and a whole range of um, uh, things around designing a monitoring system specification and that sort of thing as well. And uh, it's been a real pleasure to work with them. Um, we really believe in uh, uh, the, the Maloon Institute's aims and uh, their passion for rehabilitating uh, Australia's landscape and uh, we have signed a, uh, an MOU with them to collaborate on helping to spread the word about their practices and work closely with them, uh, culminating in this um, webinar, for example. Um, so behind the scenes, we've got Michelle keeping us on track today, and uh, I'm Richard Campbell, Managing Director of Hydroterra. So next slide, thank you. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, I'll do a little bit of an introduction about how you can interact with this webinar. Then we pass over to Luke, who's going to talk about the Maloon Rehydration Initiative, which is their large uh, research site out of Canberra, um, the various research themes that they're looking at, some of the preliminary findings from uh, the research they've already done, also looking at some of the uh, fantastic outcomes that they've already witnessed in terms of biodiversity. And then also looking at the somewhat daunting uh, aspect of the challenges we face as a nation in terms of uh, preserving our native species and uh, increasing the productivity of our land. Um, next slide, thank you. Okay, so a really important part of these webinars is questions from yourselves. Our speakers really love uh, to get your questions. And uh, in order for you to make a question, you click on the Q&A button on your screen and type in there. At the end of the session, I will read out those questions and Luke and myself will um, hopefully be able to answer those for you. So looking forward to getting some questions as well. Uh, next slide, please. So Luke and myself have been working together now for quite a long time. Um, I've been really impressed with the breadth of his knowledge in terms of um, natural resource management. You would have seen in the introduction, um, you know, what he's done in terms of, on, you know, a description of his, his works, but um, I could probably summarise that as he has a very broad understanding of natural systems, which is um, also complemented by a very strong understanding of spatial data, which has allowed him to work for various um, natural resource management agencies in the Northern Territory, and then later on with the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, for example. What I've found uh, really impressive is Luke's um, passion for embracing new technology, and he certainly has a very strong understanding of how to use various satellite-based spatial data sets to measure natural resource systems. And uh, it's been great for Hydroterra to learn some of that from Luke. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Luke, and I think we're very lucky to have him here to share his knowledge on the Maloon Research Initiative. Thanks, Luke. Thank you, Richard. Very kind words, and thank you for that.
Luke, you'll need to. Oh, yeah, that's it. There we go. So thanks, Richard, and, and also you know, extend that to the Hydroterra team for inviting me to present this webinar. Firstly, I'd like to pay my respects to the First Nations people of the Ngunnawal and Yuan country, past, present and future generations that uh, cover where I live in Canberra and the Yuan country for where the Maloon Institute's research and catchment scale project uh, is conducted. And that's extended then to all the First Nations people where our audience are located respectively. Also like to acknowledge the very generous and visionary efforts by Mr. and Mrs. Tony Coote for providing much of the resources and drive that established the Maloon Institute and this project. And backed by uh, seed funding by Vincent Fairfax Family Foundation, Southeast LLS, and of course the very extensive support by other partners, particularly ANU, led by Professor Steve Dovers. There are plenty of others that have also provided input, but it'd be a long list to go through them all. So apologies. It, the Maloon Institute is a, a small group, but it's also punches well above its weight, but it does require and looks forward to the partnerships that we've built and the collaborations that we do, because that's how we're going to get through all of this. So the Maloon Institute, we pride ourselves in, in establishing ourselves as Australia's premier scientific organisation in the landscape rehydration space. We are a not-for-profit. We do actively demonstrate, monitor and inform on those rehydration practices that we'll talk about. And Richard alluded to the two farms that we do have in the catchment that are operational farms in their own right. What do we do? Well, we're certainly all about water, the water quality and water quantity, but it extends into this integrated view of the landscape of the soil and the plants, the biodiversity of flora and fauna. It even build, goes down to the microfauna and biology in the soil. That also in, links in with our carbon cycle and the nitrogen cycle. In doing so, all these components put together and the actions that we're going to talk about today has really you know, shown signs that we can build resilience to drought, flood and fire, these and climate extremes and, and moderate those effects. We're also recognized by the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network as a, as a one of five projects. And we're certainly uh, very excited to be a part of this group recognized for the for the work that we're doing and hope that we can actually uh, provide some solutions to the many um, you know 17 goals that they're trying to work on globally and how the work here we do locally can be informing that so why is water key to reducing this climate change now there's a whole subject matter on here so i'm just summarize these key points here but water is a major regulator of climate I mean, when we, we talk about droughts, we're always looking to the sky for rain. And that rain is driven by the water cycle, the large water cycle. But there's also the smaller water cycle at the local scale. And that is connected to those carbon and nitrogen cycles as well. But water is that planetary thermostat. And uh, even with those elevated greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, water is essential to managing the biosphere and addressing the feedback loops in our climate system. So of course, good water management is critical. And the water cycle can have a dramatic and positive influence in successfully addressing these drought, floods, soil health, food production and climate, as I'll go on to explain. Of course, you know, the other part of the on-ground project is the works managed by Peter Hazel, project coordinator, and Max, who you see here, doing an astounding job, uh, but also backed with uh, other staff who have also assisted um, Bill McAllister and Ann Gibson and many others as well, acknowledging them. So the Maloon Rehydration Initiative, which is based 40 kilometers, uh, 40 minutes east of Canberra, it's uh, just outside of Bungendore, and we're effectively on the eastern side of the Great Dividing Range. In fact, the property that we have um, is split by the Great Dividing Range. You can see that red line over here. If I just uh, 
pointer options. There's the great dividing range running along through here. And this is our main property here, the home farm. This is where the pilot project was initiated back in 2006, uh, along with uh, great support from partners, Tawan Park Training with uh, Peter Andrews, who led that. And they're a major partner with the education and training aspects of what we've been doing here at the Malone Institute and often run uh, training programs. The rest of the catchment and landholders run through here. This is Malone Creek, starting up at Telegando National Park. And we've got Sandhills Creek here, another major tributary, again, just east of the Great Dividing Range. It flows in and has a confluence with Malone Creek before it exits out becomes Reedy Creek at this point and goes down into the Shoalhaven. We've got 20 landholders. We're trying to address 50 kilometres of creeks and tributaries over a 20, 23,000 hectare catchment. And you can get an idea of the array of instrumentation that we've got, that we've already established. And uh, to top this off, there's soil moisture sensors that are also started to go in as well. I mentioned that uh, our partnership with ANU, but also many other of our partners that form up the Maloon Institute Science Advisory Committee. And with that, um, an extensive uh, uh, stakeholder engagement since 2012, since the inception of TMI, that helped understand what were the key questions that would actually help identify what it is that we wanted to or needed to study and get results on. With that, we've described four pillars of, uh, of research themes, land and water functionality, ecological biodiversity functionality, the economic cost benefit analysis, and that includes not only the you know, a farm productivity, but trying to incorporate natural capital, economic cost benefit, the co-benefits, and of course the community outcomes, because this is quite a, uh, a social aspect as well about bringing the community along bringing subject matter experts, local subject matter experts, including our Indigenous um, uh, First Nation people also, who have a, the ability to be able to read the landscape and have worked with this landscape and understand how it functions. And what we could learn from that to still be able to have viable farming, uh, to produce food and fibre for what we need uh, in this day and age. Initial findings that we've had 60% increase in stock carrying capacity on the floodplain within five years of the initial uh, interventions at Maloon Creek Home Farm. We've had a dramatic improvement in the volume of water and the quality of water leaving the farm. We've we also generated resilience to the droughts and floods. And we've extreme, you know, with an extreme drought that we've just had recently, but remembering that when we initiated this in 2006, we're in the middle of the millennial drought. We've had a significant improvement in our biodiversity and habitat. We've increased our green surface area, which, you know, if we talk about the small water cycle, the green surface area or the volume of biomass, plants, trees, grass, shrubs, they are all the biotic pumps that help drive that small water cycle. Also provide the habitat. And in the cases of farm productivity, the farm production that is required but we've also created this microclimate where we can also moderate those extreme heats of summer that we get in the area, as well as creating a warmer winter by the effect of the extra water cycling going on locally and overall a much healthier environment. Give you a bit of a view of what that means. A few pictures now. This is what uh, a few of the sites of after these interventions. In fact, the bioengineering, we could call it, that the plants then take over. We intervene to try and stop the erosive degrading um, process that was happening, that was eroding out the creek beds and making the water flow faster. We, we understand where these natural steps are in the waterway, where the inputs are that are coming into the creek and where uh, a placement of an intervention would go, a leaky weir for, a better, for another term. And, then allow biology to come and take over and help then maintain these structures and work with the system to further slow it down, create the habitat, filter the water and slow it down even further. And the examples of what has occurred has really been quite extraordinary. 
Um, yes, it does. Uh, we, we, we try and source as much local materials, rocks and logs. So we're you know, trying to um, not bring in too many other external factors that we're trying to bring in local. This is what we can generate. And by even doing so, this hasn't stopped the fish passage or other fauna getting through along the creek lines. We're working with fisheries in New South Wales as well. And it seems to be that these natural systems working this way is what the native plants and fauna have adapted to. So Peter's Pond, just to give you a bit of a, an overview of just how much you can regenerate the system. It's another example of where we've now moved down further into the creek at one of the other land holdings. Working with these land holders has been fantastic. We can't do it without them. And this series of photos is October 2019. We're still in the drought. We've actually had just a small shower before that. This is in December when the structure was completed and we've had another little bit of rain. This is in February. So 2020. So this is how quickly you can turn these systems around to, a, you know, not to be flippant, but just add water. It is one of the critical drivers. Water is life, but it also water in the landscape helps generate life. It's not just about in the floodplains and the creeks as well. The principles of what we're doing of slowing the flow down, um, in the case of the creek, trying to get it to spread out naturally as it would do on the floodplains and recharge those aquifers. Similarly, even at the top of this ridge line, which is just only the next ridge line down from the Great Dividing Range, which you can see in the background there. But even these ridge lines, right from the top down onto the floodplains, everything counts. And so here, Tarwin Park Training ran a course and helped in demonstrating what to do while training at the same time. We've been able to create a leaky contour where it slows that water down gets the water down into the soil rather than just continuing to run off and down that slope. And, and that, that slope in the going off there in the distance is an easily a 30 to 40 degree slope. And yet these contours and then the tree plantings have really created this infiltration capability. And within three years, we've had phenomenal growth. In fact, in the background there, there's a two-step uh, leaky weir system. The one that's uh, the second one closer to the where the drop off is has you know fills from as overflow from the top one above it but the one above was very strategically placed by again understanding reading the landscape and what ended up happening is that it was put in in 2018 and the shower of water that we got filled it and it has stayed filled even throughout the drought period the extreme drought that we had right through to the end of 2019 it has maintained water there and, and even though the one below it will fill, but then inf and then uh, the water will infiltrate and it does go dry at times, it's still doing its job, but the one above has stayed with water. And we have not intervened with plants there, but I can assure you that there are wetland species, particularly your sedges and or cypiris that have taken over and have naturally occurred. So when you rebuild and restabilize and rehydrate these systems and understand where these steps are in the landscape you can really uh, promote the vegetation the biology to come back in and we've noticed this in the major step diffusion system that we've got at home farm that within a year of building it across a period of uh, 2017 through to 2018 that the frogs have moved back in the bird life has moved in so build rebuilding these systems habitat attracts the flora the fauna to come back in and it helps promote and rebuild and get the diversity going, and it continues to strengthen. So where does Hydroterra also fit in? As Richard mentioned, he and I have been working on, on this, and with the funding that we got from Landcare, in particular through the department's uh, federal funding of the smart farms, it has really helped us to be able to now put in place much of what we've had planning because the resourcing to do such a thing is quite extensive and the requirements you know, uh, uh, do, do take a fair bit of dollars and we could certainly do with some more. But here's what we can do and the monitoring plan and system specifications, my hat off uh, to Richard and his team, but particularly Richard, 
who has driven this and through our combined network of subject matter experts, but particularly Richard's hard work to pull this together that covers everything from all the large scale design right down to the details of metadata and naming conventions and data management. I am very excited to have Hydroterra as part of this team because without them, um, you know, it's a major, major step in the right direction. So as an example, we've got two major climate stations. These are a step up from the standard weather station. 31 soil moisture sites are being implemented, six stream gauges, 70 groundwater piezometers. We've also been doing a, a heap of monitoring with our other partners, Cybo Labs, with our satellite monitoring products and the extensive flora and fauna monitoring that we're doing with frogs and birds and fish, um, uh, LFA transects or landscape function analysis transects by, uh, devised by David Tongway and uh, the rapid assessment and riparian condition, just to name a few of the key factors that we're doing. An example of the climate station that we're doing here, it has the classic temperature, relative humidity, um, you know, wind speed and direction, but also incoming and outgoing solar radiation. We've also got a heat flux plate. We're trying to understand the heat dynamics of the energy coming in from the sun, how much is reflected back, how much is absorbed and transferred into the system. And where does this energy go? And how do we understand how this system works? Because this re relates to how do we understand what's going on with our climate and, uh, and the climate extremes and what is, what, how, what are we doing here and how does it inform the effect that we're having on the local climate and what it potentially is doing to our um, feeding into the climate change scenario. So moisture sensors, I mean, these have only just gone in recently and we had a, um, quite a nice little rainfall event, but then a flood event and up in here is where we can see that recharge. So this is down at 1.5 metres, but they're at, they position these sensors at 10, 30, 50, 80, and a metre 10 and a metre 50 we can see the recharge that happens and the rate of that recharge and the depth of it. The interesting thing was the recharge that happened at this lower depth. We hope that what we'll be doing is be able to connect that up with the piezometers to show the linkage between where this water goes, where the recharge happens. Even recently after that flood event, what we were also picking up in the top 10 centimeter sensor was this very slight ional flux that uh, speaks about how the small water cycle or indicates the small water cycle at work where we have the dew fall that it's just a slight recharge and then the plants can be the biotic pumps for the day and hopefully the small water cycle if you've got good leaf area index the more dew you attract and we can see that slight rise and fall on a diurnal basis there all early indications Hydroterra have been working with us to collate our telemetered uh, stream gauge data, which has a range of sensors on it. This one's level, and we can see that, you know, the six sensors that we saw um, from the top of the catchment right through to the bottom. Also this Sandhills one here, the pink one here. This one here in particular is just before the confluence with the Maloon. So it's an input. We're trying to measure what is the input coming from that. And it's a very interesting creep because there's, slightly different input that comes from this one. We can see the relative similarities of the pulses that come through and how it flows down through the system, the timing of it and the peaks and troughs. Now, what these leaky weirs fundamentally are doing is that instead of these peaks being really high peaks and then dropping straight back down to zero, which is what we were finding because the system would drain so quickly, we've slowed that water up and we've maintained water through the system through the dry times and it tops up again with these smaller inputs. It's the major flow events where it overtops that really recharges the floodplains. Here we're looking at salt. And this again, this is where we can see that there is a bit of a salt influx that comes in from the Sandhills catchment. We know that there is a slightly different soil there, but we also the hydrogeology that sits behind or underneath this that allows this salt pulse to come through. However, you note, it's still just under the World Health 
regulations. And yet the rest of the EC levels in the rest of the creek are well below what are deemed safe levels. <clears throat> I mentioned the satellite monitoring that we're doing and partnering with Cybo Labs, fantastic products that they've been generating to look at total standing dry matter. There's our floodplain here and the hill slopes and up onto the Great Dividing Range. Over here, looking at the non-green versus bare versus the green pasture growth. So there's a real mixture of trying to understand trees, shrubs, pasture, and where our bare ground is. The interesting thing that we've been able to do also is that they tap into the 30 plus years of time series data set that goes back to the Landsat. So it allows us that our baseline has automatically extended back. Very valuable in terms of understanding what have we measured so far and what are we seeing today and being able to monitor that um, coupled with the Sentinel that we get a 10-day a um, response. Uh, I'm able to provide as a product and a link to all our landholders that they can tap into and be able to monitor their own properties, gauge what they're doing from their land use and land management. Uh, from a day to day, but more likely from a week to week basis and get and help get that feedback loop and give it a spatial context as well. So the Maloon Institute, we are certainly working at a various scales. Here we are at the local scale, we would call it the catchment scale, the Maloon catchment. But fundamentally, the principles behind this can address a lot of the global problems. And these global agricultural problems are very well documented, whether it's food production that we need to increase to meet the demand or the industrial farming practices that have in the past that we've seen have had a negative impact, uh, whether we're talking about pesticides and herbicides or, or soil erosion, that we're actually also dealing with less rainfall. Well, in Australia, we're already living in a continent that's recognised as being the driest habited continent. So water is really important for us, especially when it only makes up, fresh water only makes up 2.5% of the world's water. And one third of our planet is severely degraded and that we lose so much soil to erosion. So the examples of what we've shown, even with the leaky contours, slowing that water down and reducing uh, erosion, but even encouraging more plant growth that helps protect the soil and slow down the rate of erosion. But also even at these different steps with the leaky weirs, that as the floodplains have always operated before they were drained or, or as the water was just rushing through and taking resources with it, that if we can slow that down and spill that out in the floodplains, we can actually rebuild those floodplains and get them to function and deposit the silt and the nutrients back onto the floodplains as they've always done. And we're dealing with the biodiversity issues uh, and we've had some very good results so far. So the challenges we face, well, water is one of the biggest ones. And we've already seen water scarcity in our own country, Australia, but also around the world, and particularly having fresh water that is, has the quality that is potable and usable by uh, not only humans, but also our stock and for uh, irrigations where it needs be. So if we don't deal with the water issues, and so we talk about, you've heard me talk about rehydration. Well, the opposite to that is if that we keep degrading and dehydrating the land, then that leads to desertification. And we know, we know where that leads to. So we need to turn this around and water will help drive that, but it is also part of the triangle of doing it to encourage plants, that help protect the soil, rebuild the soil, get the soil fertility going through microbes and nutrient uh, cycling, which also then, uh, in the wise words of uh, Walter Yenner, for every one part of extra soil carbon that you can get back into the soil, you can increase your water holding capacity by eight to 10 times. So there's a lot of good reasons why we need to look at the water and the nutrient cycle and the carbon cycle all, it's all integrated in this system's thinking. This is the way that we're going to be able to not only uh, be able to feed the world and the fiber that's required, but also be able to have the water resources that is required for people's consumption and industrial use. So soil and erosion is another big issue. It's high on the UN SDSN um, 
uh, requirements and that we lose so much soil. Uh, this also leads to some of the problems that we've been seeing with the Great Barrier Reef, with the amount of soil or silt that ends up on the reef, but also the soil that runs down and, and uh, fills up small and large dams and reducing their capacity, reducing their uh, and increasing possible problems with um, uh, blue-green algae blooms and, uh, and um, water quality issues that cost money to fix. We've got a naturally filtering system here that can do a lot of the work, do a lot of the heavy lifting, not only in that result, but also for all our producers. And so that, that linkage of the poor soil and water management can turn the land from a carbon sink to a carbon source. And this is uh, where we can really work with getting our carbon sink, the soil and our plants to start extracting more of the carbon dioxide out of our atmosphere. And the more that we protect that soil and nurture that soil, the more that we're, fill, you know, that we're able to manage our water, not only to, to enhance the plant growth, but as a filtering system, because the water still will eventually come go through the soil, the hydrological regolith system, and interact with the stream, and, and then it's filtered. And by then, the water that's leaving the property is then in as good, if not better condition, to the next downstream users, whoever they are. So simply, the solution is right under our feet of how we deal with this. And we need to restore that balance. The soil water uh, plant triangle, the balance with biodiversity, flora and fauna, and how we actually deal with the increase in uh, the energy or heat that is heating up our climate and creating those extremes that we're seeing. And we seem to be getting more and more of these climate extremes and they seem to be getting more extreme. So we need to be able to modify and regulate. So the Maloon Institute from this, we've built this network and we're actively now in five project areas, as you can see there, in Western Australia, North Queensland, in Southern New South Wales, and we're actively working uh, on solidifying other projects in these other areas indicated. And we're certainly looking to work with more project areas. We, 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 are, we are work on adapting the principles of what we do here and that they can be applied to many other parts of the country, even globally. And working with the local landholders and the local subject matter experts, including our indigenous First Nation people. It's about, it's, a, it's driven by the community and where we come in and bring also our partners to help understand what are uh, the actions that need to be undertaken, how does it fit and be adapted to that region and those local uh, situations and, and, and fit in with what is the landholders or stakeholders uh, desired outcomes. And so it is really, um, at a property scale, but also at a catchment scale where this works the best because we, uh, we notice that we get much better benefits when we all work together. And so in summary, the Maloon Institute works on improved water quality and we're reducing the impact of climate change. We're certainly moderating against climate extremes um, by improving that drought resilience and preparedness and improving farmers' productivity and profitability We've also increased the biodiversity, healthier ecosystems. And by doing this, we're also then increasing the healthier nutrient dense food, which leads to a healthy human beings, which also has an impact, dare I say it, on the cost of our health systems. There, there are so many co-benefits linked to all of this. And of course, there's the economic, social and economic benefits, whether we're talking about um, regional townships that prosper from the extra productivity, the extra profitability, the healthier landscape that helps you know, attract not only tourists, but also to encourage people to look at even living in, in those regions. Um, I have to say thank you again to Richard, and if you would need to contact us. So I'll just part with this and saying that we're a small team. We work on that we, we have partnerships and collaborations and that we're building this extensive monitoring program we certainly need more resources to help even uh, 
make this monitoring even more extensive, but we also need the research capability. So I can I call out to those people who have got resources who would like to be involved with this project and the researchers to also be involved in uh, analyzing and reporting on the data that's being collected. And you can connect through to us uh, through these links. And uh, I believe that we're going to share this presentation. There's a link here for one of our videos. We've also got a YouTube site that with many other uh, educational and uh, informative videos that have been put together. I uh, thank you very much for your time. Well, thanks very much, Luke. <clears throat> excellent presentation on what the Malone Institute's up to. I think um, in summary, uh, before I move to the Q&A questions, um, the key message here is that solutions can be simple. And, uh, you know, fundamentally what the Malone Institute does is, is a simple approach. You retain the water in the catchments and then biodiversity returns and the more you spread that water and recharge those catchments the more resilience they have to the variability that we are now faced in terms of climate change why because there's more water for those plants to draw upon um, what uh, I've noticed, um, having worked with the Maloon Institute for a while, is there's actually a lot of uh, government support for this uh, side of things. And there's a lot of international support for this as well. Um, Luke, I'm not sure that you mentioned the United Nations classification that's um, been applied to the Maloon Institute. So perhaps before we um, get started with these questions. Do you want to just explain a little bit about that United Nations program and the classification that the Maloon Institute's site has on it? Yeah, so we, we're, we're uh, involved with, uh, there's four other projects, um, you know, in, in the United States and China, uh, South America and the UK, where we're working with uh, the UN but there are the, the 17 SDSNs. And, and I think we comfortably uh, tick off on eight of those. And there's about five others that we have a significant influence with. And uh, so we've, we've been um, uh, allocated a partnership role. Um, there's, a, there's no funding involved. Um, there, there's many other projects that they, they need to throw uh, resources towards, particularly in the third world countries. Uh, which they do a fantastic job of doing. But it does give us the linkage with many of these other projects. And we're hoping that the results from this and many of the principles can be adapted to these other regions across the world as well. So uh, it's really, um, it's not a, an actively funded connection, but it is certainly one that gives us some uh, a high level of recognition and interest in what we're doing. So Luke, just before we move to questions, what does the SDSN stand for? The Sustainable Development Solutions Network um, that UN had identified 17 critical items such as water quality, water availability, food health, um, uh, uh, ecosystem health, um, human health, um, less soil erosion, um, uh, better resilience to droughts or, or climate extremes um, and, and climate change, B building that resilience, trying to um, uh, reduce the, the impact uh, so that we're not going through this uh, crash and boom cycle and try and track that crash and boom out very similar to what I was even describing with even what we've done simply even in the creek with the stream uh, bed uh, implementation of the leaky weirs is to take that crash and boom out and, and uh, moderate that energy that's coming down the system and with that carrying away those resources. So uh, uh, David Tongway would describe it that the more you have a leaky landscape, the more you're leaking resources. 
Um, and uh, Walter Yano described it well that our landscape used to work really well, that for every 10 raindrops that fell on the ground, nine would soak in and only maybe one would run off or evaporate. We've, we've turned that on around and we're now nine raindrops in every 10 run off or evaporate and only one barely uh, sinks in and does any benefit. So uh, again, um, when a system, a landscape system, an ecosystem fails, it, it soon degrades and eventually will become a desert and we, and we need to rehydrate, which is the opposite to desertification. Okay, thanks Luke. Uh, we might move to these questions. So one from Giuseppe Greco. What is the most difficult challenge when it comes to using, using satellite data and comparing it with field data? Yeah, it's a good question, Giuseppe. Having done many years of uh, doing the research and development up in the northern uh, dry tropics and savanna lands, uh, it does take a fair bit of work to understand how you can validate and calibrate that satellite imagery. But I think where we noticed the benefits was that when we got much cleverer and the computing systems allowed to be able to not just compare the classic one image over another and, and subtract the difference, um, which is where we started off with you know, land clearing or, or, or burn fire scars, we can become much cleverer. And this is where cyber labs have done very well in understanding how you can get um, these algorithms that can actually pull together this information and insert validated ground control points on biomass or ground cover levels, and then using artificial intelligence or machine learning to then build a repertoire that is relevant to the location. So it's, it's a different algorithm or machine learning that is applied in the, say, the dry tropics or semi-arid tropic rangelands of Northern Australia versus the Southern highlands where we are or Central Australia. So we understand that there are different dynamics. There's different responses to those trigger pulse events of rainfall and the landscape that it sits in. And so, yes, it does require a certain amount of validation but as we've got much better computing systems, the team at Cyber Labs have proven that they can really tighten the accuracy up and can get quite well uh, accurate predictions of what that biomass uh, uh, equates to on the ground as we cycle through the seasons. But the other beauty of that is that it becomes much more informative and those people that have been working in that area it even gets to the point that you can actually understand the signature that you're and response that you're getting in that satellite imagery. Even though we can't see the individual plant and forb species, you can get a sense for uh, the type of species makeup. If you're, you know, this is where the subject matter experts come in. They understand that on that land, in that type of soil, in that location, and given that time of season and the and the type of rainfall you get a very good feel for even what other species composition that you're getting and the response that's within that measurement that you're getting. Um, and even such things as even getting an idea of whether or not is it a perennial or annual based plant composition. So a good question there, Giuseppe, but yes, a lot of hard work has gone into that. And uh, I, I, again, Cybo Labs have really led the way in, in how to actually make uh, extra benefits out of this amazing technology and be able to apply it on the ground for real outcomes, whether it's from a research point of view or equally importantly, for the land managers out there. Thanks, uh, Luke, for that very comprehensive answer. Uh, next question from Glennis Batchelor. How or are you managing the influx of saline water? So I suppose that's about how are managing the salinity aspects that uh, mm. would occur from rehydrating catchments? Another very good question and, and very uh, uh, pertinent to uh, a number of parts of our country. Um, again, it's a combination of things. So if we're talking about, let's just, uh, I mean, we all accept that there is naturally salt in our, in our landscape. We've got a very old landscape too. Um, and, uh, and, and, and there's even minor amount of salt even in the rainfall. Um, and it, you know, depending on how close you are to the coast, um, there's naturally salt in our water. 
So how do we manage that? Well, our landscape here, the Australian landscape, actually had already formed a process of how it dealt with it. And one of the key things is, is that our soils and their clay makeup, and I'm trying not to be too technical here, but effectively, if that soil and the soil profile dries out, the clay particles have less chance to bind and hold that salt. So they become loose, let's call it. And if you do get rainfall, and if that soil is not protected or it erodes, then salt is mobilized. And it can be mobilized across the landscape into the creek, or it can be even mobilized down through the soil profile and, and, uh, and further down and collect somewhere. Now that has happened in the natural processes, but that's salt. If we're actually managing our, our soil well, and the clay and the microbes that are doing their job, that salt can actually be bound and be still beneficial because we as plants and animals need salt and minerals to survive. There's a certain amount we need. Of course, the old adage of um, everything in moderation. So the landscape knew how to manage that and, and make it available and the plants could extract it where needed. And of course the animals would eat that and the, the plant and, and take up that salt, the salt and minerals. If you've got a degraded system, that's not working anymore. The function of the soil is now degraded and the salt can become more easily mobilized. From a point of view then that we've uh, heard about where uh, the water tables moved up and, and, and moved the salt up. Well, when you've got a degraded system and a degraded system as in the hydrological, hydrogeological system that's working, that's out of built, uh, balance again. And again, uh, you know, some of our groundwater naturally has this salt. It's sitting in, in the uh, base rock or it's filtered down through the soil over the eons. But if we end up that, that thin layer of topsoil, that if it's actually functioning well with, as it should, from a plant, soil, water functionality integrated, that that fresh water lens that you would naturally get in that topsoil that benefits the plant growth, that freshwater lens will naturally, being less dense, hold any intrusion of salt coming up, being forced up by groundwater maybe, um, that, it, that freshwater lens will hold that salt in place. And that way still allow the plants or crops or to, to grow quite well and not interfere. And meanwhile, you're actually re making that soil function well, that it also continues to um, uh, hold or bind the salt and minerals and the microbes do their job in making them available to the plants as required. So you can manage salt in the system. We've just got to understand how the plants, soil and water work together, particularly in that top one to two meters where it's critical for plant growth. Okay, Luke, um, thanks for that answer. Um, I might add to that, uh, the work we've been doing with the Maloon Institute's been looking at um, effectively the water balance of these catchments and the processes of how water moves through these catchments. Uh, it's interesting to note that a lot of these areas used to be prone to salinity and with the changes in rainfall patterns, um, that's become less of an issue with uh, less water held up in the catchments. As you put those dams in place, you tend to, you will lead to some raising of the water table, but if that's done in parallel with the other works that they're doing, such as the, letting the, the vegetation re-establish itself, then you get to a new equilibrium. Um, so it's, in terms of managing that, it is about understanding those hydrogeological processes of the catchment scale as well. And uh, there's a lot of data being collected by the Malone Institute to look at that. Richard, Next. just on a, on a quick point of uh, correction there, I, I, would, um, I would prefer that um, uh, not using the word dams, because that there's certainly, I don't want to give people the wrong idea that we've built dams. They are certainly leaky weirs. Um, they're, they're absolutely designed to leak water, not only over topping them, but to go, you know, to leak through it. Um, yeah, it is quite a um, point of difference because we don't want to give the idea that these are, are dams per se. Leaky weirs it is. 
Okay. okay, we've got a few questions to get through, Luke, so we better okay. keep Let's moving go. on this. Um, Scott Wright uh, asks, can you give more information, re key lines, and how or what resources you use to find these lines? Your words mm. may have been natural land steps and water inputs. Yeah, good question. Um, uh, look, it... Uh, Reading the landscape is one one way of uh, being able to do it. Some people can are very clever at being able to do it naturally, like you, uh, the such of Peter Andrews and Stuart Andrews. Um, I, I found that um, from a point of view of looking at using LIDAR, that that helped understand where those natural steps are. Other parts are actually being able to understand by even looking for signals of plants and uh, and how they interact as a, as a way of understanding where those steps might be. But what, what it's really trying to say is that these steps can be at a micro scale and at also at a macro scale. So a macro scale is the Murray-Darling Basin. There's a whole series of steps all the way down to the Kuyong. There's also smaller steps that even within a paddock, you can have these steps occurring where there's that break and slope. Um, so this is why we, we say that you know, it is good to go and get the training to understand what it means to read that landscape, look for the features, but also then um, better still to make sure that you're putting these things in the right place, that you do need to have some sort of um, you know, capability to do even um, surveying of a type. Um, and it can be formal surveying or, 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 or a sort of a, a, a more sort of backyard style of surveying to understand where the contour line needs to be. Um, key line is a different style of thing um, because you're sort of redirecting water, whereas we're trying to spread water laterally. And in doing so, because these are leaky contours, by spreading the water laterally, that you're actually then getting to um, rehydrate 100% of the country down, um, down slope of that whole contour. Whereas if it wasn't there, the water would just run down into the gully and possibly only hydrate maybe 10% of the country. But because you've channeled all that energy into a smaller area and gravity is going to drive that, you then are susceptible to erosion. So it's a combination of things. It's that, that There's a whole four day training course on explaining all of that. And I'm not going to do it justice in, in five minutes. Sorry, Scott, but there is a, um, you know, there is some very good information about how you read the landscape. And this is why it's very important to be able to then understand how that adapts to your local environment um, and, and how the plants actually help create those steps. You can even go to a hillside and see how even individual grasses create micro steps. And if they join up, they can create that leaky contour. Nature already does that. Um, there's examples of it here. We're trying to fast track that by intervening because we need to try and stop the erosion and the dehydration. And by intervening, we actually fast track the, the response and the recovery. All right. Uh, thanks, Luke. Another question from Scott uh, was, does this uh, approach also point to those areas that suffered fires and floods as sufferers of poor land management practices? Um, uh, so with that question, Scott, I think the, the broad answer, I think that, you know, the general broad answer to that is yes. Um, we could always be doing much better land management, vegetation management, etc. cetera. Um, yes, there's also been proactively where just poor land management has exacerbated that. And so um, my general response is, is that Throughout the catchment, whether or not we're even talking about, and I don't want to just highlight farmlands either, because a lot of our national parks in uh, New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland recently suffered extreme fires, and that's partly because of the dehydrated effects. But it was also about that the whole landscape itself had been drained much faster, and that exacerbated that was exacerbated by the extreme drought. Um, so those, those two things in combination ended up leading to what were very extreme and um, uh, devastating fires. Um, and so I, I look at it that the principles again, whether we're talking about farmlands or even our 
um, native uh, natural, um, sorry, our state parks or national reserves, they all need to be managed with this in mind and where we can to try and encourage that rehydration, um, which will actually help promote the vegetation growth. And people are worried about that, that promotes that vegetation growth with fuels it. But this is where then a combination of, if it is hydrated and, and there is a level of water in the system, whether it's in the plants or in, on the, in the leaf litter, that we can actually reduce the severity of those fires. This is why we say we can moderate that. If also that we've got our waterways and our wetlands and swamps that naturally would have been occurring there, they help break up the pattern of just a fire being able to pick up speed and blast through an area. That these green belts or wet zones can actually help slow and retard a fire's progress in building up uh, such energy. So there's a number of factors there, let alone having water in the system that our firefighters and our landholders can utilize. There's many other things there but also a rehydrated and a system that's creating the biotic pumps, dare I say, also attracts more rainfall because we understand enough these days of how plants and the water cycle and the cooling effect of plants actually helps benefit by attracting more rain bearing clouds to bring rain to that area. A bare ground, hot ground will actually help exacerbate and reduce the ability or push rain bearing clouds away let alone if it does rain, it tends to run off much faster. Hope that helps, Scott. Excellent answer, Luke. Uh, Peter Fisher wants to know, have you any thoughts about how the results from this site might be applied to drier areas such as Northwest Victoria? Yeah, very good question. Um, there's certainly all these principles still hold true. And again, it's about adapting it to those local conditions. Um, I point to such examples that look at very much a similar principle of what we're doing, the EMU project. Uh, hats off to that team over there in Western Australia. And they've, they've been doing work in Western uh, New South Wales and I believe even in Northwestern Victoria. Um, and dare I say it even, um, the, the example that for the last, uh, look, almost 30 years now of Wood Green, just north, a, part, a large pastoral property north of Alice Springs by Rob Purvis, he's shown that Again, those principles of water ponding in a very much an arid desert environment certainly has made his property stand out when I was working in the area from 2000 to 2003 with the satellite monitoring. His property stood out like the proverbial. Now, there's very good examples of how this can work at that local scale. And imagine if we could actually get the community working together, that the benefits could actually be much more extensive. So, yes. Absolutely, the principles can be, and it's about then picking the right plants that suit the environment to suit the outcomes of what it is you're after, whether it's land for biodiversity and nature, or whether it's for production systems, there is a way of how you can get that system to regenerate, particularly through rehydrations um, activities and actions that can fast track that and then working with your local subject matter experts to then help you understand what plants will actually then help to build and drive that system. All right, Luke, good, good answers there. Uh, we've got uh, a couple left to get through and we've got a very short amount of time. So let's... All right. Uh, Steve Kimber from... Uh, I'm not sure where Steve's from, but... His question is, what are the regulatory impediments to these projects? For example, interception of overland flow. Hmm. Steve, good question. Um, again, it really does come down to your state, territory, and even your local government um, rules and regulations. Uh, as an example for us here in New South Wales, it is uh, the in-stream on creeks of a level th uh, order of three or above are highly regulated. It does take quite a lot of work. We are working with the regulators to try and uh, see how we can um, get the type of work that we do, um, get a, a special sort of dispensation. That's not to say to throw away the regulatory approval altogether because we do want to make sure it's done properly and not just uh, haphazardly. Um, in terms of across the broader landscape though, and that includes all your ephemeral little gullies or, or hill slopes. 
Uh, to a large degree, there are the, the regulatory impediments that you would find in a um, recognised waterway. Um, but I, I do always defer to this, making sure that you just check with your local authorities. But broadly speaking, that's our experience here in New South Wales. I think the same is said to be in Victoria. Um, Queensland and Western Australia have slightly different rulings on that. But we always encourage people to look into the local regulatory aspects, tap into some of your local subject matter experts and others that are working in that area to find out what is uh, possible. But broadly across your landscape, you have a fair bit more leeway but, and, a, and a lot more opportunities of this is where your active production systems are and what you could achieve, particularly if you don't have a creek and a floodplain system. All right, Luke, excellent answer. Last question. Uh, we've just gone a little bit over time. So this is the last one for the day. Thank you very much for your questions. So Simon Winfield, can I ask about the 60% increase in stock carrying capacity? Has this been achieved with no change in how the stock are managed? Therefore, was rehydration the only change made? Good question, Simon. I would have to say that um, it hasn't been able to be totally discerned or separated the rehydration effects from the land management effects. And what I can say is, this is exactly why I'm really looking forward to the research where now we've got all these other landholders that have um, uh, gone, that, have, that are part of this project. And so what we've got now is a range of landholders that of practice conventionally or some other uh, or regeneratively let's call it and 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 a bunch of people in between on a sliding scale so this is where we're hoping that as we then change or rehydrate and do these actions down through the catchment and then we can actually see what is the difference between land use and management and the rehydrated effect if that's now the constant as we now extend this through the catchment we hopefully get a very much a better idea of what part of it is um, uh, related to land use, land management and the rehydration. But look, the, the two do go together. It's very difficult to try and separate that. Um, largely, I suppose there, it was, um, there definitely was a bit of a change in land management, but it was also the fact that it was such a degraded part of the floodplain that, um, it, it really had, to, and we were still within drought, that it took a fair bit of time. There was only so much you could still do, but the rehydration effects really did kickstart it because without that, there wasn't even the water in the system during the back end of the millennial drought, 2006 to 2009, to even really get things going. So it was quite, uh, quite amazing that the rehydration really underpinned that change and the land management came as a co-benefit once we got plants growing again and then the careful ma continued management of the grazing enterprise meant that the benefits then really started to be seen. Good question Simon, we hope to be able to have more results for you in due course. All right well thank you very much everyone and uh, a big thank you to Luke from the Maloon Institute for today's presentation. I thought that was excellent. Um, feel free to reach out to the Maloon Institute or to ourselves if you've got any more questions. And uh, that concludes today's webinar. Many thanks. Thank you, everyone.